God. Good morning, good morning. So this morning the Lord said that he wants to speak to his people. So let me explain to you what that means. There are times that God will give me messages that possibly one hour right before it's time for this call. <clears throat> and in the midst of that, he will literally verbatim just give me keys and points and scriptures and he'll say, look the scriptures up. So today he said, I want to speak, which means that he has a special word to the heart of somebody. And you might say, well, do, you know, do you really mean that someone could be that special that they would change your message? Yes, yes. I have encountered, I've had a message on Saturday morning that was Friday, that was done on Friday. I was just studying it on Saturday, and I went into a store, ministered to someone, and the Lord said, that is the word for the day. And then I have to go back and start all over again and give that particular word. Well, uh, two days ago, that happened. Two days ago, that happened. And the Lord God gave this word. So I ask that you will open up your hearts and receive. Again, get ready to to write notes of that that actually touches you. Let me explain that. So whenever there's something that I say, you might say, well, I've heard that before, or I already know that. Or there may be something that it sounds so loud to you, or it literally pricks your heart, or it convicts you, or it definitely sounds as if somebody is saying it to a 100-degree magnitude, it's so loud. It's not that loud to everyone else. It's loud to you because God himself is breathing on the table of your heart. He's knocking on that heart saying, let me in. Let's deal with this. He's saying, that's that thing that's holding you back. You're questioning me. This is why. So take that and and use it as you need to as I will begin the word of God. There are three dangers of living a double life as a Christian. Now, let me let me break that down for those of you that are real analytical and need to know the specific category. There are some people who, who as a child, received Christ, and they, they probably did not know what they were receiving, but their mom and their dad told them about Jesus and that they needed to receive him, but they did not know what that actually meant. So you have that person, right? And then you have a person that maybe have come to know God as they uh, uh, maybe an adolescent or maybe possibly a young adult, and they had an encounter with God, but they didn't stay on the path to get any depth roots inside of them. Then you have this adult who came to know God in the midst of a life when they had this horror going on, something tragic happened to them, and their way out was to run to God. So in the midst of them running to God, they came to know the living Christ. And in the midst of that, they had an encounter and a transformation. However, after they got over the trauma, they deviated, okay? Unaware, they picked up some things and they sort of, forgot about the trauma, and went back to that life. Then they have some that are spirit-filled, power-packed, walking in God, know who he is, but still have a weakness. And this weakness causes them to live this double life. Every one of these profiles that I just mentioned at any given time has probably lived in some type of double life. They may have called it, um, well, I think I needed to, you know, I'm young and, you know, I need, I need to get out and be involved and do other things other than just church, you know, or the one that just says, well, I go to church on Sunday because, you know, I have a real busy job and, you know, so that's their excuse. Unaware, they begin to live a double life. But this morning, I thought it would be befitting to study the book of James. The book of James has impressed me. That's been my 
But this month, that is the book that I've been studying, and it has so blessed my heart. I tell you what, I, there is a way that I feel as if I've been putting myself into the character of the writer of James. And I, I find so much in common with James. But the book of James sometimes also is known as the epistle of James, which an epistle, you know, you know, is a series of letters. Now, James was writing these series of letters to the early church. If you hear the tone of James, even some of the commentaries and different of uh, the different writers in the early years struggled with the book of James. They did not want it to be a part of the actual original writings because James is a very strong um, book. And if you if you think about it, let me give you just a little bit of the background uh, of James, because James is going to be our fellow partner for today. He's going to help us to come out of the double life. You know, so James framed um, his letters with um, on the background of patience, perseverance, trials, temptation, dealing with the tongue. James really go into the inner life and walk. James writes to encourage, you know, the readers literally to be consistent. Uh, In his writings, he deal with the inner walk of believe what you say. He also uh, encourages readers to walk as mature Christians in the faith. Uh, On one of the writings, he actually uh, implores you to do what you say you believe. So I can understand why they would struggle with James because um, James didn't really give much mercy. He His mercy was get it. You need to believe what, walk what you believe. He te- um, encourages us with the temptations and, and the trials and to persevere. Don't give up. Don't quit. Our first scripture is going to be James 4 and 8, and it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Now, that's our foundation scripture. Let me go back and break it down for a moment. Draw not near to God. When you are near to God, you will not be double-minded. Whenever you become double-minded or begin to have these multiple battles, that is when you will find that you're at a distance from God. Isn't it amazing that James thought this first scripture at draw near to God? So what is that saying? When you're not near, that's when you get off. So most of you might say, well, I'm struggling today. And the first thing I would say, well, how, how, when was the last time you read your Bible? Did you, when was the last time you did your own Bible study? When is the last time you worshiped? Are you really praising God? What is on the inside of your heart? Did you stop and start? And then he says, and he will draw near to you. So that means when you're struggling, when you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. When God draws near to you, there's a major strength that has empowered you. You almost get like an endowment whenever you draw near to God. And then he draws near to you because there's a coming together of power. He's actually taking the fear and the pain out of you and replacing it with his power. He said, cleanse your hands. Mm, My goodness. So that means when you find yourself in a double-minded place, your hands are not clean. Oh, that's something you've done. Somewhere in the background, you've done something. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinner. You know, James's tone, if you read it in the context, now I'm reading out of usually the English standard, but I think this is King James. He talks in a tone that you know he means business. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart. That means you might say, well, prophet is, what, what's going on with me? Baby, there is something in your heart. I know you want to believe that your heart is perfect, and we all do. But whenever there is a struggle and whenever there's a battle, there's something in the heart. He says, he didn't say 
if you have anything in your heart, purify your heart. No. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinner. That means he knows you sin. And purify your heart, you double-minded. Now, James means business here. That means you have begun to allow the world to come in and make you doubt and make you struggle with the unbelief. Otherwise, if you think about it, the minute God says something, you will move. It reminds me of Abraham. The minute God would tell, told him, go and look, he moved. He didn't struggle in his faith. That's why he was known as one of our, our in the history of faith, of one of our, our faith leaders. Because he listened immediately. But he says, cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart, you double-minded. So that means you've allowed something else to come in your mind and split your mind. So what splits your mind? Lust splits your mind. Homosexuality splits your mind. Masturbation splits your mind. Adultery splits your mind. My God. It brings your mind in two. Now, let me explain to you the process of that. <clears throat> when you have walked with God, you have received his mind. You are of him. You've received his teachings, his mind, what he hates, you hate, right? But when you draw, don't, are not near God and you have not allowed him and your hands are not right, and you walked in sin, and now you've got this, you know, where your heart needs to be purified, you come in a place where your mind becomes split. Let me walk you through. So when you come into the path of deciding that you're going to commit adultery, you have taken the love of God and the articles of God and split them in half and decide you're going to do this part. So then you become a split person. When you decide that even though God has made you a man and you decide that you have an affinity for men and all of a sudden you decide that he's wrong, you're not a man, I think I want to be a woman, you become split because you have the Holy Ghost here, and and I did say Holy Ghost, you are filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you deviate into this other lifestyle. And when you do that, you become split. And that's when the spirit of suicide comes in. That's when the spirit of hate, that's when the spirit of unbelief comes in. And when these three sisters come together, you actually want to jump off a bridge because you were founded in the word of God. And every time you read the word, it kept, the word of God is deposited in you. And now you want to deposit something else in you. So your mind becomes split. Oh, Rabbi Shekhe, Father, breathe on them today. What is a double life? It's when a person leads two separate and different lives different lives, and they are two different people in each life. Okay, so let, let me give you, you know, uh, some type of scenario of that. So you have a wife that all of a sudden the enemy comes in. So your house becomes a target, okay? The enemy says, oh, they got – I'm." They got too much, um, too much power going on. They got too much oneness. They, they, they're ministering to too many people. I'm going to set a trap. So he finds the weaker vessel, whoever leaves an open door, whoever's prayer life is down, whoever decides to eat ice cream and Oreo cookies instead of praying, whoever just decides, well, I don't need to go to church that many times a week, who just decides, well, I read my Bible, you know, on Sunday. I don't really need to word up. I'm good. I'm good. I've been reading the Bible all my life. I know scripture. I'm good. Little does she know there is a snake that has just, been knocked on the door, and he literally beelines the weaker vessel. So he goes after her. So she decides all of a sudden she's lonely. He torments her with a spirit of loneliness. And all of a sudden 
every other man looks better than the one that she's married to. All of a sudden, she's not pleased. All of a sudden, she starts getting ungodly counsel. All of a sudden, she's attracted to single friends now, and she's starting to envy their freedom to go out and not have to be accountable to anyone. Unaware, she has been targeted. So he just decides that she says, well, I'm going to try it. So this man sleeps with his wife. He does not realize that all of a sudden his wife is getting ready to start living another life. It started with a thought. She begins the battles in the thought. And once she gives in to one thought, a tsunami of thoughts come. And because she does not bound it up, she does not use the word of God, she just does not bound and loose God, and she's not on her game, she doesn't see the target. She doesn't see because she thinks she's on a vacation because three months ago she had an encounter. And because that encounter was so amazing to her, she felt like she was okay. Little did she know that there were many battles. So she begins to live this double life. She's in church on Sundays, but in her heart, she's lusting after different men. Her eyes are gazing, and from the gazing eye starts the thought. And the thoughts is causing her heart to change towards her husband. Ah, my, cool, rabbi. So what changes when a person is, is, has a spiritual double life? When they're in one life, their, their voice will change. Their speech, their vocabulary will change. Their attire will change. Their thought life will change. Their daily communication will change. You know when someone has entered a double life because they don't want to talk words. I can always tell when someone's been in the presence of real gossipy people because they, I can't stand their voice. Whenever they say something, it, it looks like it takes something out of me. And I'm thinking, what is this? And then if I listen closely, I could tell they've been talking. They've been gathering information. Ah, Rabbi Shiki. So what is different when you take on this double life? They, they become what they need to be at the time to appease the deep pain of who they're really not. Oh, let me say that one again. So this person becomes this, this double, lives this double life. So that means on the job, because people know that they're a Christian, they become whatever they need to be at the time. Literally, to, they're appeasing the deep pain that is on the inside of them. Because when you open your mind and your spirit up to um, other uh, spirits of perversion, Literally, you have a thirst and a desire for perversion and lust and sex, and therefore, you've opened that door. So now that door, unless that door swings completely open where you can appease that that, uh, desire that's down in you, it becomes painful. Then, in order to really be, so they become what they need to be at the time, because if the people at their job are expecting them to minister, they become a minister. Little, if someone looked on the inside of them, there's such a deep pain because they're really screaming to come out and be who they really are, and they're really hurting from who they're not, so they take on this double life. And then when they leave work and they go in their home, they deal with this pain of what they have actually opened the door to. And the door doesn't have to be just to uh, loneliness or to perversion or to lust. 
It can be of many other different things. But because they've opened that door, now they got that battle of thoughts on the inside of them, which they're really wrestling for their mind. And typically, if somebody doesn't come to truth and run for cover, if they don't run to that mentor, run to that pastor, call that prayer partner, run to the word of God, hit that flow and cry out to God, if they don't, they will find whatever they need to appease the deep pain on the inside. Sometimes the pain can be a pain of rape and trauma as a child or rape and trauma as an adult or a rejection, whatever the case may be. But when you talk to them, you can hear the pain reaping out of their voice because they're looking for someone to fix them. And if they don't have that person, they feel like as if I have no other choice. Sometimes as a coach, I'll ask them, what got you here? I just felt cornered. That's what they'll say. I felt cornered. Uh, and what does that mean? Like, I felt like I had no way out. This was the only way I had. I had to take this way out. Under the deception that when they take that way out, there was going to be some relief or some some uh, uh, a, a moment of rest when in actuality, once they stepped into that world, there was a different kind of war and danger that came upon their lives. Now, the, the people will assume another person's personality who they admire. This is another way that you can assume a double life. I remember one particular woman said, she said, well, I didn't like my life. So I, I took on someone that I admire. I took on her life. So they will, t- they will assume the person's personality who they admire, because it's better than who they really are as a person. Now, I know that sounds a little uh, off and strange, and it is. Truly, it is off. But you would not believe the Christians that do that. And sometimes they do it because they, they don't have a way out. Like, I don't have anyone to deal, help me deal with the trauma. I don't want to, I don't want to remember that my mom you know, allowed X, Y, Z to happen to me. I don't want to remember that my dad did not want me. I don't want to remember that I was no longer, you know, my husband cheated and left me. I don't want to deal with that. So I just choose another person, and I become that person. I mimic that person. I mimic how they walk, what they do in life, or I hide in education. Let me just go to school. I can get in my nuclear of being in class. I can wall out everything else. I don't have to think about it. Little do they know that once the break happens, they may go to school. The minute school break, when there's a school break, she's back on it again or he's back on it again. The pressure, the, 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 the pain of real life is, is dropped on them. Now, in most Christian cases, and I'll, I'll say that, in most Christian cases, the person actually believes the lie and literally build their life around this lie. And you might think, but prophet is, this is Christians, this is people. See, you have to understand, there's very several levels of Christians, several different levels of Christians. Oh, my God. So they build their life around the lies until the demonic kingdom aborts ship. So that means... You enter this big ship, you get on this demonic thing, and you just start believing the lies. So the boat is going down the water, okay? It's just moving. But what the enemy does is eventually he's going to make you shipwreck because he's going to throw you overboard. Once he's filled you with all these lies, he leaves you by yourself. And the demonic kingdom shipwrecks. He just leaves you. All of a sudden, they're gone. And only thing that people will see and how you look to them is, what is she doing? Like, she really believes these lies. Like, what is she doing? And unaware, he's preparing for the kill, leaving them in a mental state of suicide, spiritually shipwrecked. When you are spiritually shipwrecked, that's when the enemy 
has fed you a lie. You opened that door. He pulled you into that demonic kingdom, put you on a boat down the river, and then all of a sudden he aborts you and leaves you, and your ship becomes shipwrecked. And at that point, you're too embarrassed to go to church. You're too embarrassed to call the people that you've hurt. You, you, you know, you barely feel like you're qualified to even go to church or even repent. And sometimes you've created so many alliances with demons that you got so much going through your it's hard to even repent. I remember praying for a young woman, and for almost two hours, I had to to trying to get her to say the name of Jesus or to pray in the spirit. She said she felt like inside her mouth was locked. Literally, it took two hours to get her to say the name of Jesus. She said the thoughts were all in her head. You're not worthy. Remember you did this. Remember you did that. Now, that's when there has been a real demonic lock on that person's mind. And literally, it leaves them in a mental state, almost as a mute. They shut down, won't talk to anybody. They get in this silent mode. They start contemplating suicide or doing crazy things that could literally lead to the death of their life. See, some of you all really think, oh, well, I've never had a suicide thought. Okay. Well, remember that time that you just decided to go wild out with your friends and jump in a car and they're doing crazy stuff, riding down the road, just having a blast when well, you could have went to jail, you could have shipwrecked, you, you went and tried drugs. Baby, you were on a suicidal trip. Trust me. You just decide, well, you know what? I'm going to null it out. I'll take some. Let me try this. Let me try that. Thinking it's going to null the pain. Little do you know when you wake up in the morning, the pain is there and it's added another friend to it. Now, when it leaves them in a mental state or in a suicidal uh, capacity or mindset, it's stealing, it's literally stealing the person's most treasured relationship and precious years of their life. Sometimes when I think of some of the years that people have wasted, but see, that's what the enemy does. He steals your years. You should be living for God and, and walking for God and, and going to school and preparing for college and for marriage and by not. See, so in, you end up and then you're almost 40 years old in that same cycle. And you've torn up so many relationships. You've lied to people. You've lied to family people. You've tricked them. you stole from them to appease whatever uh, tragedies you needed to fix in your life because of the last cluster of lies. It's almost like you're spiritually robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're using finances. You're going on trips that you know you can't afford. My God, living your double life. In most cases, they will hop from church to church trying to find a hiding place or a church of like kind. Now, let me, let, let me just break that down. When a person is in a double life, the enemy traps them. Their spirituality, they're questioning it. They don't know if they deserve it. So that unbelief is trying to rise up. It's battling them. They don't feel that they're worthy. They don't believe that the love of God and the repentance of God will wash them, that literally all you have to do is repent and confess and go back and mend your ways and just say, sorry, I apologize, I did this. And confession, confession will free you, oh, my God. Confess, confession will give you a, a, a free card to fly. But the enemy doesn't want you to know that. But James 1 and 8 says, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. See, so they'll jump from church to church to church. Everybody, oh, they wasn't good. Oh, something was wrong with them. Something was wrong with that. Oh, well, you know, I, I didn't like her word. Oh, I didn't like his word. Oh, well, that church is too controlling. They're not going to tell me what to do with my tithe. They're not going to rule my life. I don't need that kind of religion. 
girl, I got to have my fix. I don't need all of that. I'll get them on Easter and Thanksgiving. But that double-minded come. That means that they're indecisive in every decision they make. Have you ever met anybody like that? Now, I do understand that there are times, because there are times I will say, let me get back with you. Let me ponder that. And I may, out of my own heart, say, sure, I'd be more than happy to do that for you. And then when I get home, the Lord will set me down in the midst of that person's life, and he'll say, you can't do that. He'll say, look what it's going to cause. He says, she's not dealing out of reality. She thinks you're her mother. And then I'll go, oh, my goodness. And then I'll have to go back and say, I, I need to rethink that. Is it possible we could tweak that a little bit? Let's try Let's do this instead. And most time I don't tell them. When you have a double, a, live this double life, church hurt is inevitable because of the web of deceit. So you're living in lies because of the pain and trauma that you've experienced. So unaware, you go to these churches where you think, you know, it's just going to make you perfect. Some of them, if they're spiritual, they can see it on you. If not, then you just join in the crowd, hide in the masses, just sit in the bag. But you'll be able to say, I went to church. What you do Sunday? Went to church. What was the word? Girl, they spoke from James 1 and 8. Unaware that you are James 1 and 8. Because of the double life, on Sundays you can be on the left side of your brain. And then on Monday and Tuesday you're on the right side of your brain. But if anyone brings that up, oh, uh, oh, this church is not right. Something's wrong with everybody. When the common denominator is you, because you're the one doing the church hopping. You're the one that literally can't deal with both lives. And there's such a web of deceit, you're unable to come out. The person typically ends up alone. Because there are so many different baskets of lies. So when I went to this church, I told them I was this. When I went to that job, I told them I was that. When, when, when I was with this one, I told them I was that. So then I tried to get it together, and I told the counselor I was that. And then when I went to see this other pastor who doesn't know my pastor, I said, oh, I'm this. So there's so many baskets of lies that you literally end up alone because you have to tell, a, a, you got to remember the lies that you told everybody. Hopefully you don't deal with someone that's very, that's spiritually sharp because if they are, they will remember your lies or they will be able to see the lying spirit coming out of your mouth. So it's so sad because they end up alone in the web of their own minds of the battles that are in their minds. And this is nothing but the hand of the enemy. It's one of his strategies. And one of the sad parts about it is there's no relationship. Because I told so many lies, I don't have anybody I can really tell the truth to. So I really don't have a friend girl. I don't have, I don't have nobody, my high school friend. I can't talk to anybody because I don't have anybody. I can be just be me. I can tell the real truth the dirty truth, no matter what. So there's no relationship can be forged unless the person is spiritually blind, just like me, or spiritually immature. So if they're spiritually immature, well, you could tell an immature person all kind of lies. You could build all the fantasies up. You could make them believe you got a husband. You can make them believe whatever you want because they're so spiritually immature. They wouldn't know the difference. They just join in your lies and say it sounds wonderful. Or if the person is spiritually blind, they can't see the demons coming out of your mouth. So if they're spiritually blind, they can't see. So you can tell them whatever. But you still don't have anyone that you can be true to, that you can be free with. So there's no relationship. So therefore, you feel so alone. How does the double life process start? 
Okay, let me give you an example. The split life develops when sin enters. Sin is the COVID. You're blaming your mother, your father, your brother. You're just blaming a coworker. You you just say, they did me this. They, it, it's not them. It's the demon that ignites sin because the split life develops when sin enters. Once that sin enters, enters that mind of that person or whoever afflicted you, when that thought gets in their mind and they build on that thought, they're able to forge that sin against whomever. Or when you are removed from your spiritual covering. When a person is removed from their spiritual covering, they become a target. I I tell you what, during this COVID-19, I have had such a passion and a burden for pastors. I really have. And I tell you what, people of God, when the enemy sets a trap and moves you from your spiritual covering, you are out there alone. And let me just say this to some of you who are walking in that double mind. You might say, well, prophet, I'm, I'm, I gave my pastor an offering Sunday, and I was at church, and, um, and I love my pastor. Okay. But see, there's a way you could be in the house and still fall from your pastor. You could be living that double life. You won't stay close to him because, you know, if you get too close to him, he's going to see it, and he's going to call you out on it. So you sit in the back of the church. You give your offering. You know, everything's at a distance. Ah, my God. See, because you actually spiritually separated already because that double life has already started. My God. It's already started because you entertain that seed. But let me say this on the behalf of pastors. These pastors labor for you. They stand in the gap for you. They stand when you don't like your own self. When you remove your spiritual covering, the enemy loves it. So when you remove your spiritual covering from your life, you have no idea what you've done. And when you don't leave one place the right way, you bring that same spirit to another church. That's why if a pastor is really spiritual and they ask you what church were you previously a part of and why did you leave, trust me, they know you're bringing a spirit there. They are already aware that you're bringing a spirit because you haven't, um, you haven't dealt with it. Or they know you're running. They call you a runner. They know you're running from something. What is the cause of a double life? Unrighteous desires that are hidden down on the inside of you? What makes people tell one lie to one person, another lie over here, live two different? That's two different lies. Yeah, you got people think you're one thing here and they think you're another thing over here. Unrighteous desires, hidden sin of anger, inherited generational traits, lust of the heart, deprivation, and poverty. Let me break those down. When you have unrighteous desires on the inside of you and you don't use your authority, when you don't use your authority, and the minute that thought comes, you have entered that world, and now you got these unrighteous desires. So that means the enemy is going back and pull up everything you used to be in, everything, even before you were saved. He tries to resurrect everything. He'll make you go back to calling somebody from 10 years ago, looking up people on Facebook to connect with, giving people your number, under the auspice of that you're going to minister to them when you're really trying to get with them. Hidden anger. You're really angry at other people, so you just decide, fine, God's taking too long, I'm going to build my own life. It's, it's my season now. It's my turn. Okay. Inherited generational traits. 
Sometimes these things are inherited from your mother, your grandmother. It comes down the line. Just create your own generational chart and watch your aunt and her children and your uncle and his children and go on your father's side or your grandfather's side and track that down. And what is it? You do the math. So sometimes it's inherited traits. But God has given you power and authority. You do not have to succumb to it. I'm not going to say that the battles will not come because every one of us has battles, but you don't have to accept them. Lust of the heart because you're lusting after something in your heart. And lust is not always just sexual lust. There's many forms of lusting. There's some people got to have 10 cars and five houses and They never get enough. They just need more and more and more. Lust of the heart, and it's deceitful because it's in there. And you have to understand, Satan is slick, but he's not smarter than God. If you pull on the God nature, you will become wise to see his tactics. But you're not wise to see them because of the lust that's hidden in your heart. So you're really feeding your own heart. You know that God didn't tell you to move forward, but it was a nice way out, and that lust kicked in. Deprivation and poverty. Sometimes when people come from a poverty background, they think everything is their last chance. Oh, oh, this this is my way out. Everybody's trying to find a way out, even if it means stepping on your head to get out. Oh, my God. I bound the spirit of offense today in the name of Jesus. If you receive this word, God's going to bless you. He's going to open up your mind, and you're going to be able to become a strapped warrior. What could be a simple start of a split mind? Let me give you a very simple, common way that it starts. Let's just say a young girl goes to college. She's been in ministry all her life, and she goes to college. And all of a sudden, the atmosphere that she's not used to, she begins to succumb to. And then who she is at ministry when she comes back to visit is not the same. So therefore, she's, uh, she enters college, and then she, be- she picks up the mind from there. And unaware, it's it's sifting from her. And that double mind starts. So it could start from someone entering college. If you meet a new friend and their spirit is more dominant than yours, and that friend takes you over, to you, it's somebody new, somebody you could share your story with, somebody you, oh, somebody I could talk to. When I get lonely, I can talk to them. Unaware, you're transferring spirits. Unaware, that tradition is hitting your life back. Unaware, you don't even know what that person is struggling with. And then you pick up their struggle, and all of a sudden, your double life starts. Dating a new person. You you, you hooked up with them over, over Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or some dating website, or someone you just met in your church that you is a new person that joined the church. You have no clue of their background. You have no idea they dealt with Ouija boards. You have no idea they visited a witchcraft worker before. You have no idea that they believed in Illuminati and two or three other religions previously, and those spirits have not come off of them. You're unaware that they got all kinds of phobias, and all of a sudden, you pick up the phobias, and you don't even know where it comes from. You join a new church, which does not require a lifestyle that strives for holiness or spiritual accountability. So you join a church, and you just merge on in with a bunch, with, with a bunch of people who live double lives. All of a sudden, now you are start to live the double life because that's my church. Oh, oh, my church don't, no, you know, my church don't teach holiness. Well, we believe it, but, you know, we understand. We under grace. 
oh, girl, my, you know, my pastor, if, if, you know, he good. He, he believes in grace. Just pray for grace. Grace will wipe it off. Well, you'll end up in hell talking about grace going to wipe it off. Sin is sin. God is still holy. He still believes in holiness. He still will bless the righteous. So you're telling me that God is, there is a woman of God or a, 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 a young girl or a man that's walking for God, believing God, doing the right thing, and you think you're going to get the same reward? Seriously? Now, you don't even need to be educated to understand that. There is not going to be the same reward. There is a reward for walking God's way. There is a reward for waiting. There is a reward for waiting for for marriage to have sex. There is a reward. Ah, but when you join a church, there doesn't. There's no accountability. Nobody cares. Well, you know, we have. Were well, you on the Bible Bible study calls? Why weren't you at church Sunday? How's your prayer life? Have you started a fast this week? How you doing with those struggles? How you how your family doing? No accountability. If nobody, it's accountability that made me align myself because I knew I had to look in the eyes of a prophet that was going was 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 definitely ranked up enough that he call you out. He would call you out. And and you know what? At one time I thought this man must be crazy. But what I later learned is that it saved my life. It made me draw to God. I knew that on Sunday, he was going to look in our eyes, and he had them prophetic eyes. Oh, I knew I I I was going to repent. I was going to make sure I had my life together. And for a while, I did it because I knew I had to meet him. I I knew I had to see him on Sunday. And because I knew that, it made me align myself. But what happened is it made me get, begin to walk sensitive to God. And it brought me into a place of accountability even for myself. Because then I began to dissect myself when nobody was around. My, 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 my. Oh, my God, Father, bless your people today. So um, what could be what could be a simple way that, the double-minded start, let me just go, uh, entering college and still being in the ministry and the battle, meeting a new friend with a dominant uh, characteristic, uh, dating a new person that you don't know enough about, joining a new church without accountability or that doesn't strive for holiness, or feeling hopeless or as though you have no other choice. I know that doesn't sound spiritual, but you would not believe the Christians that say, I say, but, well, sweetheart, how did you get here? I don't know, prophetess. I just felt like I had no other way out, so I just did it. I'm like, you just got, you just got married just because you felt you had no other way. Did you didn't know anything about him? I, I just felt, I felt like I, I had no other way. If I didn't, I was going to be put out of my apartment. So I just, I just, and I didn't want to sin, so I got married. I'm like, oh, my goodness. The enemy paints you in a corner. God does not do that. God says he will provide a way of escape. Let me say this. Those people become two completely different people. So that means to their children, they are one person. And then in the nighttime when the children left, they are another person. When they go to church, they are one person. Before their pastor, they are one there's so many, so many times, I just pretend like I don't see it. People will come to spend a day with me or come for one or two days, and they, 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 they will make me believe they eat healthy. They will make me believe they just, oh, God, they're they, they, they going to get up at 5 in the morning and pray. They're going to be seeking their word <laughs> and, and, and make me believe them. And little do they know I have eyes to see. But I'm not going to, you know, police anybody. It's not my job to police your spirit. I just war and tell the Father. But I know the double life is there because they're two different people. Actually, sometimes I can hear them cursing. 
And the Lord will let me drop right down in their conversation. I'll heal them. I'll hear the cursing come out of them. I'll hear the profanity. My, 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 my. I, or I thought I was getting away with it. But little by little, it was happening day by day. When you open that door and to that double life, then you got to tell another lie and another lie, and it becomes a web. And little bit by little bit, you're being sifted. You go to college. If you don't go there with a mind strapped, one of the things of the programs that I wish I could create is a year-long program for children before they go to college for one year and prepare them for college or maybe three months the summer before they go to college and prepare them for the walls and the battles that are in that campus because they're not ready. They're not spiritually ready. They're not mentally ready. They're not, they're not English ready. They're not ready. So they enter the walls, and they're doing all types of things just to, to pass. And to, they're not used to uh, uh, the battles and the wars and the spirits that are on those campuses. My, 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 my. What are the warnings, and how did we miss them? Confidence, how, did, how do I miss these warnings? I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I love God. How did I get here? My God, how did I get here? I don't understand. Lord, how did I get here? Battles in the mind. The minute those battles start, run for cover. You missed it because when you should have run for cover, you hid and you didn't tell anybody. Hidden sin caused by loneliness. When that spirit of loneliness hit you, run for cover. Call somebody. Get on a prayer line. Find somebody. Go volunteer at the church. Get around a strong person. Go help them. Go. When my mentors were near, I did what? Hey, can I help you? You clean your house today? You want me to help you? Let me help you. You go and clean your car today? Can I come help you? I wanted spiritual, and I was going to do whatever it took to get it. Whatever. Because, see, I realized nobody had to do anything for me. My pastor didn't have to talk to me all the time. Nobody has to do that. It's not anybody's job to constantly police you. You are supposed to get in the word yourself. Some of you are blaming your parents. It's not your parents. You're a grown man and a grown woman. You better seek God for yourself because your mother can't get you into heaven. And she sure can get in your mind and fight those mental battles you're having. But the minute the battle starts, that was a warning. The minute the loneliness kicked up, that was a warning. All of a sudden, you can't hear God's voice any longer. All of a sudden, you feel confused and you don't know what you're doing. (laughs) That's a big sign. No longer convicted by the tugging of the Holy Ghost. So you missed the tug. So when you lied and you listened to gossip and you got in people's business, baby, that was, you, you are on a beeline to a double, a double life because you no longer are sensitive to the tugging of the Holy Ghost. You begin to judge others. Those are the warnings that you're split and you got two lives going on because when you, typically when you're in a double life, you think everybody's wrong. You, you can't see yourself, and you find fault with everything. It's because of the unrighteousness that's in you. Because now righteousness burns your ear. Righteousness makes you perturbed. You become distant and misjudging the voice of God. At one time, you knew the signs of God. Now you're missing it. You'll be like, how I miss that? God, why didn't you tell me this was coming? Oh, you let me go through this humiliation. No, God didn't let you go through the humiliation. The warnings were there. You missed them because you're at a distance because you have taken on another mind and you got some evilness in that heart, as James told us in James 4 and 8. Let me go back and read that scripture one more time, just in case you forgot it. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, 
and purify your heart, you double-minded. Don't you hear the attitude? He's trying to say, wait a minute. You blaming other people? No, what are you blaming other people for? You missed the warning. Let me, I'm going to go over them again. Back when the mind battle starts, run for cover. When the loneliness pop up, run for cover. When all of a sudden you can't hear God's voice anymore and you're confused, run for cover. No longer having a conviction of the Holy Ghost. Like you're just missing it. Like you're just missing it and think you're right. Run for cover. Judging others, run for cover. Become distant and misjudging the voice of God. All of a sudden now you're distant from God. There was a time you would hear house of prayer and a fire would come up under you. Oh, my God, there would be a power that would come up under you. Not anymore because you're missing the warning. Living a double life as a Christian, sometimes we can often be warned against it in the Bible. Let's go to Revelation 3 and 19. John talks about how Jesus is grieved by lukewarm hearts that just can't seem to choose who they, who they really are in God or in sin. They don't know which one they want. They lukewarm. Now, you might think lukewarm, sometimes people will actually refer to that as being before you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's so not the truth. That is not the truth. That is after the Holy Ghost has come and you become lukewarm, and you done lost your fire. When your fire is going out, when you no longer have an ear to get up with God, at one time God woke you up at 2 in the morning, there are times that you'll, be, you, you'll get up to use the bathroom, and all of a sudden you hear God, you start thanking him, you start loving on him. My God. You hear that house of prayer and that fire and that Holy Ghost will bubble in your belly. There was a prophetic word burning in your spirit. How do you get rid of a double life? There's only one antidote, really, for getting rid of a double life, and that's the heart of a repentant and surrendered. A repentant, surrendered heart, that's it. Because you forged all that pride, and that pride has brought a wall up over your heart, and your heart is hardened. That's why you don't no longer, you're not, you're not uh, convicted by cussing a little bit, or you're not convicted by getting angry and holding things to your siblings, or being angry because somebody didn't do something for you and harboring it on the inside of you. It's not easy, and the truth will hurt. The truth hurts. When you've lived this double life, and you have to literally come out of that thing. Now, people of God, I'm, I'm saying this very lightly, but I want you to know this is a serious demon to get out of because you have come accustomed to it. And then pride comes in and saying, well, you know, oh, my goodness, but it's not easy because, you know, the pain is going to be there. And, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do then? How am I going to pay for this if I, if I get rid of her or if I get rid of him? You know, and, and, but it is a necessary pain that will lead you to a greater relief and peace. See, once you come into truth, the pain leaves, and it leads you into peace. Often we're afraid of the light because we, we don't like having the shame being exposed. Other people to know, well, I've been leading this life, and I lied, and, and I did do this. Unless we let the light of the gospel shine through our brokenness, danger awaits. And there are three different bondages that I'm going to give you today that's going to tell you what will happen when you don't align yourself with the word and get out of that double life. You will have, you will, you'll be growing in bondages. So you may have started with just, you know, getting a friend that was worldly and uh, maybe every so often just going to a little family party. Be, within weeks, you'll find yourself, now you decide to take a little drink. All of a sudden, now you might just decide it's okay to date. But we're really not dating. We're just really friends. 
all of a sudden now it's okay to stay hours on the phone talking nonsense and ungodly talk. And little do you know, your bondages are growing. Number two, loss of hope. Because then there is a conviction because now that mind's doubled. One part of your mind still got God and the word in it. And the other part of your mind has got this newfound sin you've brought alive. So now it makes you hopeless because that's what the enemy does. He he now began to say, it's almost like somebody put you on drugs and they say, oh, just try it. It's just going to make you feel good. They don't tell you it's going to put that yearning for it. They don't say that. Then when you don't get the stuff, it puts you in a deep depression or withdrawal. And that's what the enemy does us. So number two is there's a loss of hope. Unless there's some type of repentance or or, or, and thank God for the prophetic ministry that could tell someone, hey, I see you going down. Can I spend a day with you? Can, can you uh, Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Something's going on. Wait, wait. I hear something else. What is going on? Number three, spiritual death. The end, the end is for a spiritual death. For godly relief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produced death, 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. So the three dangers is growing in bondages, loss of hope, and spiritual death. The trap of living a double life. Mm -hmm. My God. There is a trap that is set to make you live a double life. People of God, open your eyes, surrender to God, and ask God for mercy. Now, some of you all might think, well, I'm not living a double life because, you know, I'm not into anything. Sweetheart, you can live a double life right inside of your church, working right beside your pastor and live a double life. I've had people that work right beside me would not take the warning, didn't even understand that they were working right beside me so I could cover them, I could see for them, and still would not take the the warning. Would stay right, literally come and spend three days right here with me and lie the first day, the second day, I say, okay, are you ready to tell the truth now? I'll give them the warning, and weeks later, they're back in the pig's pen. They're back. In a, in a lost place again, because they opened up the door for the trap of the enemy. The enemy devised a plot to revolve you into convincing you that we can live two lives. Oh, some people actually think they're good enough, and you're really not, because when you live two lives, it's pressure, it's stress, you anxiety, you stress out about. Who's going to know? Did they find out? You, your anxiety, you already think everybody judging you. They don't even have a clue of what you're talking about. They don't even know what you're saying. But you're, you're so prone to think because, you, you know, you're in your own stuff. They thoroughly enjoy the thought of us living our lives daily, uh, divorced from our faith. That's what the enemy wants to do. Steal your faith. But I say unto you today, come out of these double lives and walk in freedom and walk in peace, and you will fulfill your gift. You will fulfill your ministry. Come out. Go to your pastors. Go to your mentors. Get help. Don't allow the enemy to infiltrate you with this stuff. I pray that you've been blessed by the word today. I pray that there's something that I said that has, has blessed you. Oh, my God, I tell you what, this has blessed me, but I thank you, I thank you all for, for just receiving the word. Receive it and walk for God. God bless you. I pray that you have an awesome day. God bless.